the truth is, you, you, the, the miracle is in the house. It, mm-hmm. it, the, leader, the, the leaders are there ready to be developed. It's just, will we focus on helping them become who God's called them to be? Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to the Grow Leader Podcast, where we grow leaders that grow churches by helping them reach their full potential. We're so glad that you're with us today, sitting right beside my pastor, Pastor Chris. How you doing, Matt? I'm great. I'm excited about the episode today because of our, our guest. I'll let you do the setup to introduce him, but I, I love it anytime this man is, is around us here at Highlands. He, he's, he's a great person to be around. He is, and I'm loving this bonus content where we can bring in some of our favorite people to uh, let them share their wisdom and their experience in, in church growth. And yep. welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you guys are with us. Uh, today. And I want to introduce Pastor Jeff Little. He's not new to our church because we've had him teach our staff. In fact, that's where we've used him the most is with our staff, but he's spoken on Sundays at Highlands for me. And he's in town uh, because of recently speaking at our men's night and uh, has a great message toward men we're going to talk about a little bit today. But Welcome to the podcast, Jeff Little. It's such an honor to be here. Again, I feel a mutual the same as uh, you guys do. I, I, I love to come here. I always leave with more yeah. excitement, more encouragement, more passion for building leaders in the local church. I mean, you can't get yeah. around my good friend Chris Hodges or what's happening here at Highlands or Highlands College and not leave more passionate about where God's placed you. Okay, but let's be honest. Yes. There's another reason we, we've been able to hook you into coming here. Yes. Come on, tell them about the fishing. It's all about bass fishing. So, <laughs> <laughs> And so, yeah, Randy Howell is part of Highlands. Tell them who Randy Howell Randy is. Randy Howell is the 2014 Bassmaster Classic champion. <laughs> And uh, I am passionate about bass fishing. Now, Jesus, no offense, but there's no golfers in the Bible. Okay. <laughs> this is a great point. Now, say that again one more time. There's for all the no golfers, the- but there's a lot of fishermen in there. Okay, <laughs> Jesus was friends with fishermen, but Randy's become a friend, and uh, we, we're going fishing tomorrow. So I'm excited about that. And he actually shows some of his professional. Talk to, I mean, what is, what's involved when you're with a professional? Like if I was playing well, golf with a Jack Nicholas yeah. or a Tiger Woods, I, I know what they would be telling me. What, what, talk to me well, about Well, I mean, that's not the topic of today's podcast, but Jesus did in Luke 5. <laughs> he goes to his disciples and he goes, you guys catching any fish? And I can hear the tone in their language. They're thinking, <laughs> isn't he a rabbi or something? Why is he talking to us about fishing? Right. Y'all know the story. And he helped them catch all these fish. They had to signal to their partners. He said, now you're going to catch people. And it's the same way. Why am I fishing with Randy? Why would you tune into a podcast like this? The best way to learn to catch fish is go with somebody that knows how to catch them. Models and mentors. Models and mentors. And so, yeah. So I pick up from Randy, you know, tips, tricks. All right, give us just one. We're going to get into the content, but I got to hear just one. Well, so here in Alabama, the, the Gunnersville Lake is kind of a bass capital, and it's on the Tennessee River. So you do have reservoirs here, but the Tennessee River, there's a unique type of fishing because you have current and that current produces sandbars and ledges. So I've watched lots of content about it, but never experienced it till I got to come here. So a lot of people, when they think of bass fishing, you're going down the bank. But Randy taught me about deep water ledge fishing in current on the Tennessee River, which means you use a heavier bait. You have to, it's really more about locating the schools. So that's, hey, I'm learning about church and fishing Look, when I come to Alabama. This is a first. We've never talked about fishing on the Grow Leader podcast. Hey. There's a pastor here at Highlands, uh, Pastor Alan Pedram, who I've been trying to get to listen all the time. I know he'll listen to this episode because well, he, he's, hey. he's a fishing fanatic. Well, I'm passionate about the outdoors, but I love awesome. tournament bass fishing. You know, is one of my favorites. But okay. you've become a better fisherman being yeah. around one. a guy who basically won the Super Bowl of bass fishing. Yeah, if people don't know it, I mean, the Bassmaster Classic is the Super Bowl. $300,000 dollar prize in 2014. Wow. So getting around him has made me a better fisherman. Awesome. Which is really what, honestly, I'm not trying to be corny with the yeah, segue, but, but it really is what we're trying to do uh, with Grow Leader. Our premise is models and mentors that yes. you can get around people who know what they're doing in a certain area. Yeah. You can learn from them. And that's the value add, Matt, that we try to bring yeah. our listeners uh, every month or twice a month to bring people who are experts in certain areas. And yes. we want you guys to take great notes in all these areas. If you're driving or working out, you can't take notes. We always have show notes. We will send you of the material. But I want to talk I want, I want to talk today about an area that you're an expert in. But to do that, let's set the context 
Tell them very quickly your kind of your ministry story and what you're currently doing. Well, I started, I have a unique story in the sense that I went to Baylor University in Texas, had a call to ministry at 12, went to college at Baylor, was a youth pastor at a church where the pastor decided to get a master's degree in history. And they, they made me the pastor at 21. They, wow. they actually called me the temporary interim, which yeah. they were trying to emphasize this is really short term. <laughs> you, know, you know, my first assignment, they called me a temporary interim. Did they? <laughs> I was a youth pastor. They said, we're looking for a youth pastor, but you're going to be temporary interim <laughs> until we find somebody. I think we should bring that back. We should yeah, bring real, that. Real glorious yeah. entry yeah. into ministry. Yeah. So I have that in common with you. And I planted a church at 23. And then wow. at 25, I took over... Uh, a church that was established. It was really a learning experience transitioning a church that had merged some congregations, had a lot of vision drift, some pain, like just really learning about transition. At 28, I brought 32 of my friends, people I discipled. They sold their businesses in West Texas where I was pastoring. We moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area and planted Milestone Church in 2002. Well, wow. and today, talk about the church a little bit. Well, we have uh, a main campus in the Keller area, uh, which is just west of the DFW airport. We have a campus in McKinney and Hazlitt. Uh, we just we just kind of completed building out our main campus on fifty four and a half acres. We, in fact, just recently, you know, just just moved into the new space, twenty five hundred seats, wow. and all. That's awesome. You know, you look back and you're just like you know, amazed by all that God's done. So Yeah, and, and those of you that are listening right now on the podcast, I, w- I want you to really take some good notes because I, I know leaders, and this is a great leader. He's, he's implemented some of the, uh, you know, the grow technique, if, if, yes. if, if I might call it that, but you've also been able to adapt it mm-hmm. to your culture. And then you have an area where you've really leaned into as it relates to developing men. You've written a book um, uh, uh, for men that I want you to talk about. But talk about some of the things that you have learned in the grow leader context and then how you've adapted it because there's so many churches and leaders that are trying to do that. Well, the the base format of grow, of course I knew you know, we've been friends before grow, before arc, before right. highlands. I, I mean, we knew so there was there was things related to getting people on a path for training like grow track or whatever. We 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 had small group models. We so so some of these tools that you've really brought together in grow have been years that I don't think people really realize this. Like th- these are years and years of tweaking and testing some of the grow model. So I was following that with you know brother Billy, your father in law. You know he and I. Yeah. So uh, th- this is really uh, years of it. I would like to talk specifically though. I mean I believe in the grow model, the financial model, the the system of small groups, grow track, dream team, serve, all of the things, uh, our church's DNA is very similar. Um, I want to speak when it comes to men, though, a, a specific area that I recognized, um, the legacy giving you know, model, the, the, not, not just, it's really not about giving, it's about stewarding gifts. I, I think a lot of people misperceive that and they'll pick up on a podcast and not understand the heart and think, well, we're just talking about that. Legacy is really about stewarding a particular gift, meaning people, they work with resources, they know how to make resources, they have a motivation. They're going to give them somewhere. We want to put right. in front of them what we believe, uh, you know, what Jesus said really is he's building his church and I'm, I'm sitting here doing the podcast and right outside there's a sign in the hall that says, we believe the local church mobilized is the hope of the world. So we want to help them invest those resources to what I believe to be the greatest evangelistic discipleship organism, not just organization on the planet. That's the And church. you've been very successful at it. Talk to them about the recent uh, building campaign that you're a part of and, and how uh, the men and the families of your church gave toward that. Yeah, so we were about 3,500 people in a grocery store bought this acreage. The first phase uh, was about 25 million, and even at that size, our church gave about 11 million cash toward that project. Wow. Then we now have expanded our auditorium to 2,500 seats. We built a 30,000 square foot kids building and more commons, really to build our base campus. This last phase, due to inflation and the time, you know. 
31 million, but our church, as of this last Sunday, where they gave 2.6 million in one offering on a Sunday, wow. they've given $23.5 million toward the 31. Wow. <laughs> well, you've got a lot of people's attention right now. Get into the weeds of that. Talk, I know talk past- about, literally, literally talk about though the, how that happened, but not just from the from the asks and the vision, but but you were obviously developing the families yep. and the men of your church in a way that, that made them have the capacity to do it, but also believe in what's happening in their local church. Well, you know, we go back to the fishing analogy, but you know, you still you still have to put gas in the boat, you still have to row the boat out there, you still have to mend the nets, throw the nets, do all the stuff. But the question is, are you catching any fish? Right. So right. how do you catch fish? If you if you simplify it in my mind down to its lowest common denominator, you have to have leaders. You focus on that. That's why you have this podcast. Right. I'm preaching to the choir. Laborers, harvest, connection. But then you have to have space because at least for the majority of the people listening to this podcast, to take care of sheep, we have to have a barn. We have to have a place to feed them. When they say go to church, they're still saying, I want to go to a place, hear the word of God. My kids can get a Sunday school lesson. I can meet some friends. It's still that portal. So therefore, the leaders listening to me right now, they understand I have to make space to facilitate these experiences in, right. in these people's lives. So it really becomes leaders in space. And what I've learned is when you run out of space, you're growing your leaders and when you get new space, you're lacking leaders. So you're right now listening to me. There's somebody out there going, I, I need new space. Well, then you need to be developing leaders to prepare for new space. That's very good. But if you got a bunch of new space, you're looking around going, we got space, but we don't have leaders. So you're in between those two. And so what I would say is for me, specifically speaking about men, um, the book that I wrote called The Way to Win, I like to say it this way. Sometimes I've written a few books, um, you know, one on identity and one on getting close to Jesus. Those are more where I have a message that brings you to maturity. I wrote The Way to Win not as a message to necessarily bring to people, but a problem that needed solved. Okay, talk about that. This is the problem. I'm starting a church in a cafetorium in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, all around my city are the people you watch on television. There I am in a cafetorium, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. there's buildings in DFW. Check your kid in with retinal eye scan. You know, <laughs> wow. and escalators. <laughs> yeah, escalators. <laughs> Smiths are here, right? I'm in a cafetorium, and I need I need leaders and space. I need both. So I know I've got to develop. And I think a lot of pastors, somebody listening to me right now that you're just like, well, that's your context or this reason, and we can excuse away where we're at. The truth is, you, you, the, the miracle is in the house. It, mm. it, the, leader, the, the leaders are there ready to be developed. It's just, will we focus on helping them become who God's called them to be? So I just started with what I had. I brought 32 people. We did a mailer. We got seven weird people showed up one Sunday, <laughs> and a, whole, a whole group. And so I just started working with where we were at. The way to win was, and it can be used as a devotional for, you know, a man can grow personally. It could be used as a small group. I know there's guys in Highlands use it for their small group and they're growing and developing as men. But the way it's really meant to be designed was I realized that we're, we're asking of these leaders in our community, hey, help us build the church, become disciples, become this, or help us build buildings or help us with resources. We never ask them, what are they really looking mm. for? They're looking for coaching. They're looking, they're looking for the same thing. Why would someone listen to this podcast? They're looking to try to get better. So what I realized was the coaching industry has become multi-billion dollar industry and we in the church, that's what we do. Right. And so I started inviting groups of guys to really, this is a 38 week 10 month in our church, we let it be two small group semesters. Right. Four, and getting in the real weeds, we actually take our assimilation process. We look for, you know, some people used to call it fat, yeah. faithful, available, teachable, but I think the people you're looking for are not available. So I call them fit, faithful, influential, and teachable. Hmm. And those people, 
you know, turkeys flock, but eagles soar. So these are the kind of people that want to be invited into a specific cohort experience. So I just started repeating what you do in Grow Leader, what pastors do, stuff I'd been a part of, coaching settings. And I took every year for 17 years, I took a group of 10 to 12 guys that I drafted, not as a part of the infantry, but as a part of the SWAT team. That's great. And I said, you know, don't come if you're not, you talk to these guys different. Mm -hmm. Don't come if you're not serious. I love that. Don't, don't come if you don't want to reproduce. Don't come if you don't want to. This is a group of guys who want, and, I, and I, I would work on it all year the previous year, invite them in after the new year kicked off, and I would spin and say, you're my focus. The same way I do today that you do, mm -hmm. I'll take a group of pastors and I'll go, I'm giving you my year. I'm going to focus on you and help you grow. I did that in my church for 17 years. Wow. 6 a.m. when no one was looking, when there were no TV cameras and I was never invited to any podcast as great as this one, behind the scenes, because discipleship and development and building, everybody wants Lee Domain to come to their church and fix their leg. Could you get us a legacy program and get us 23 million like Jeff Little? You want legacy, but my, my opinion is, for most of the guys listening to me, you know, it's not about the program. It's about you building the people to be a part of it. Because what do they do? They, every pastor is going, how do I grow my church? My point is, if you build people, they build the church. That's exactly right. If you grow people, they'll grow the church. The guys I had in my group, you know what they wanted to do? Build the church. How do we get a building? As I got them even inspired toward our vision, they're, you know, Guys break, guys make stuff happen, man. I mean, it's like That's exactly when, right. when we had an ice storm in DFW, they found a tanker truck of water. <laughs> they, they started cutting trees down that were probably illegal and bring them to people so they would have fire. Yeah. One, guy, one guy bought a four-wheel drive. He said, I'm doing this for Jesus, honey. I got to get one. <laughs> That's awesome. You know? I mean, it's, yeah. they, they're wired to activation. But the point that, that the listeners, I hope you caught this, and that is he didn't ask people to do something for the church before you did something for them. Yes. That they cannot give, they cannot be a part of something if you haven't discipled them into that capacity. That's right. And it's a missing ingredient in our pastoring because we won't where that's going to end now. Yeah. And it's a part of the Highland story that a lot of people don't know. It's true. Uh, that early on, I, I led a men's group for the first five or six years mm -hmm. of the church, all business leaders at the public library at Mountain Brook yep. uh, 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 Crestline Library, and but just taught them leadership, leadership, just poured into them. In fact, every time we had a men's discipleship group, I always was thinking, can I give them something today that can not only help them in their personal growth, their family, but also something they could reteach at their jobs as like a sales meeting or a business meeting. So I was letting them basically cheat off of me of things they weren't preparing. And I used to tell them, here's, here's the handout. You can have it. And, and, and you can take scriptures off if you want to to bring it into that business context. That's so good. And they were taking it to their businesses. And I was equipping them that made them successful. And just like you said, uh, Jeff, those the people that I developed in those years are some of the strongest leaders in our so, church so let me today. ask you guys both something about that then because i think you know there's some truths you can talk about this in the book and we'll link the book in the show notes so you guys get that these there's truths and myths about discipleship and i think the two of you anytime i've ever heard either one of you talk it comes back to shepherding and discipleship yeah. right I mean, you know i think a lot of times we're good at hunting when you really need to be farming there's some it's stuff so you need to grow for a long time how important is consistency? Like what are the truths and kind of best practices to really discipleship, disciple men and people uh, long-term in your church? Well, again, what I realized was these guys I was after, they, they had gone through some small group cycles, but I would recommend to every pastor, if you wanted to get some people behind the vision, get them go, start growing them. Why did I make this book? Was I, I actually did my doctoral dissertation by studying what we're doing to disciple men empirically over a three and a half year period wow. across the church in America. Wow. And what I realized is we don't know what we're doing in reaching men. We're having big events, we're breaking phone books, we're, we're having car shows. They can get entertainment better than we can give them outside the church. 
Say that again, my brother. I love that. They, 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 they will never be able to entertain them. That's not our space. Yeah, they don't to want to compete. throw axes. They want, they want better marriages. They want to learn how to make money we, better. They we want have to, some of that, and we'll yeah. have a crawfish bowl. I mean, come on. But we'll never be able to, the, you know, the, the stadium, AT&T Stadium in our city with a $75 million Jumbotron, I'm sorry, I'm not going to compete in that space where Jerry's world is with the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> right. But I'll tell you what I can compete in the space of, I'm going to make you rich where you're poor. I'm going to help you be rich. They've got lake houses. They've got, th- they got, they got lots of options. But I want to make you rich where you're poor. I want to help you with your marriage. I want to help your kids. I want to help you in those areas. And, and if, we'll, if we'll step into that space, I love... I love Robert Coleman. This is a book from 1958 on discipleship. He calls it the master plan of evangelism. He says, it's slow, it's tedious, it's relatively unnoticed, but in its end, it's glorious. He said, the generation coming behind us is looking for someone to follow. The question only is, who will it be that they actually do follow? He says, are you living for the momentary applause of popular recognition? Are you living for the investment of your life in a chosen so few that will carry it on long after you're gone? So two questions for you then. Uh, number one, talk to us about the actual process. What, de- what day did you meet? What time? Give us a little I'll bit more. I'll give you more, th- more guts. And we, we also, I also have a series of videos coming out that's like driver's ed that I'm going to post Great. that I'll give you that you'll coach you Great. through. That's awesome. Thank Let me you. be very clear. Because of Grow, most people listening to us, if you don't, you need to get an assimilation process. That's what Grow Track is. That's what we're funneling people to. That's exactly right. Getting connected and becoming a part of the team, dream teams, assimilating them. So what I ask my assimilation area to do every year is as we're assimilating people, we're meeting them in step one, step two. As they're coming through, then what we're doing is identifying people that would be candidates for this type of group. If you've got a church of 200, if I'm the pastor, you need to lead it for the first couple years. Then you'll find one or two people. We're not trying to have 50 of these in a small church. We're trying to get, it's about quality over quantity. This is, these people don't flock. So what am I doing practically? I'm looking in a one year calendar year for people that would be potential invite only candidates to this group. In that year, I start that starting the next year. I invite you in. I start in November of the previous year inviting you in. And then once a week, I'm take off in July because a lot of them travel. We put a, another experience in there to meet wise family. Let me tell you what the church has that, and I'm not against coaching. There may be people listening to this and thank God for everybody trying to help people. But I will say this, I've been involved in coaching groups. The problem is there's nothing for your wife or kids if it's outside the church. What we have in the church, if we'll run these plays in the church, these, these men get connected. We have a women's group. We have a kid's That's ministry. So we have church motion. We have, a, we have stuff for the whole family. That's right. So we're integrating them into the experience. But yeah, it's a weekly, got to be firm on time. You don't want more than 12 guys. Because remember, it's, it's about the cohort. They think they're, on, they're the only one that has those struggles. Right. You know, the, I had the, my greatest testimony from my last group. I ran this in our church with just what you might call our general small group system. And then I went and began to just go out in the community and go, who could I pastor in the community that no one else could pastor? And I just began to reach out to people in the community. My most recent group had guys in an area where we're starting a campus to help the campus pastor mm. reach the community. I started the group wow. and turned it over to him. And it was high-end leader people. And the best testimony I had was, I, this is simple things. My first homework assignment, they were, all wanted to talk about their wives and their challenges. I said, go home tonight before you go to sleep. Grab her by the hand and say, honey, what's on your heart? And pray with her. Now, these are people that do, hmm. do speeches in front of their shareholders in our Fortune 500 companies that were scared to pray with their wife. Let me tell you what pastors do. We'll make you rich because she don't care how good your speech was at your shareholders meeting. She wants to know if your heart's connected to her. Wow. And he broke out in hives. 
<laughs> and I'm making him rich where he's poor. That's I had great, another man. guy in the group go, it's the first time I spent Christmas break and I wasn't worried about my wife looking at what was on my phone. I didn't have a nervous Christmas break because I was actually walking in integrity. Wow. wow. So talk about some of the areas um, that, that, that are the most impactful. I mean, I know they yeah. all are, all 38 areas, but talk about the things. You know, I have a heart, I have a heart, you know, um, one, of, one of the messages I know you had me come and share and talk with your staff that you had, that I shared at ARC, that you had your whole team listen to, That's right. is I think just in general, these are topics that are pastoral related, but they love the fact that we also understand where they live. And so there's leadership. There's a whole section in here. I'll, I'll give you the five breakout areas that I, that I found because I did empirical study. Yeah, and I want to know and, more and about I, the research. I want to tell you about yeah. the research. And, and yet, though, what I found is a lot of pastors, and I just want to encourage somebody listening out there that I talked about being a shepherd. You know, First Peter said, shepherd the flock of God. There's no category for Instagram influencer or celebrity, it's, it's we're shepherds. Yep. And I think a lot of pastors, you know, the church growth movement kind of got us even grow. You get into grow. The essence of the grow system is a pastoral heart toward people. Yep. Right. It's, it's just the processes that reflect the ethos in the heart. So you'd hear statements like, well, shepherds have small churches, ranchers have big churches. But I'm finding a lot of people today who want to be ranchers who don't know anything about sheep. <laughs> Shepherd the flock of God. Do it willingly, not begrudgingly. It's our service. So I just started shepherding these guys, pastoring. I have a pastor's heart. Obviously, what you do practically changes. But I started studying where are their pastoral deficiencies. You know, a good shepherd knows Hey, it looks like their coat's off and they're not, they're a little malnourished. I mean, they're anxious, they're afraid. And what I learned was these things. Number one, the first section is that what would happen in all our pastor's cohorts? How's your soul? Have you really thought about a Sabbath? How are you rested in your spirit? So I talked to them about soul life, inner Good. life. I talked to them about what we all know as leaders have a tendency to self-sabotage and blow your life up. So actually, John Maxwell did the Ford, and I had him read the manuscript, and he helped me in the first section to back it up, to even connect to a secular audience with those, those things. Most leaders think about everybody else, and I give them permission in the start to think about you. That's okay if you're thinking about you to help you grow so you can yep. help others. Yep. Okay. Second area is men want to know the Bible, but they're embarrassed to not know the answer to the question. That's great. So I have a section in here that actually helps them with, it's kind of what I'm calling a cliff notes on the Bible. It's where I took a systematic theology, quote unquote, and bring it into everyday life. And I make it to where it's not, you know, denomination centric or even our church centric. I'm just trying to help you feel like you, you understand how this thing works and how you could engage with it. Yep. The third area that I deal with is, what we all know, like if you work with men, we know sexuality, yep. money, and leading their family. You know, they, they marry a wife. She's excited. You know, it's amazing, spicy. You know, okay, but no one gave me a manual here. She's got all these words. She's got all these <laughs> challenges. You know, I mean, it's like, man, I didn't know. I feel like I got a tiger by the tail, and it was exciting at first, but I'm intimidated now. Right. You know? Yep. And so... If I can help them so with good. sex, money, and leading their home, those three areas, you don't have to pray about it. They need help there. Yeah. And the empirical data shows it that that's their biggest three struggles. Okay. Yep. So I, I hone in on those, help them with kids and parenting. Not a lot of that out there today. Like I think we're all that's intimidated because right. we're all in the fight too. But I, I had spiritual warfare riding on parenting. I didn't want to put it in there. Because I'm still parenting. I don't want to be, and I'm not saying I'm the expert, but I feel like somebody's got to help these yeah, guys with some tools. Right. So I went there. I mean, I had spiritual warfare. I was scared to do it. But it's been some of the things that I get a lot of feedback. Next thing is leadership. How do we do what you did? Because I believe there's not much difference in what a business guy and a pastor. There's some, but man, there's so much that's cross-applicable in the that's area right. of leading and serving people. So I do a section on that. And the final thing I do is they want to reproduce themselves. Jesus didn't say, go have church services. He said, make disciples. 
so they don't know how to do it. So in the end, I talk all about reproduction. Last week, I listened, during my quiet time, I was like, I want to listen to leadership something. John Maxwell, this is circa 90s when 21 (laughs) Irrefutable Laws came out. And he's up there in some old church and the video's fuzzy, and he said something. He said, we all know it. It's basic, but it hit me like a ton of bricks. That's what I did in this last chapter. He said this, leaders, if you lead followers, you will add addition. If you lead leaders, you will multiply. Then he said something that stuck. I, don't, I, I remember it, but don't remember it. He said, if you, most people who lead followers is because they need to be needed. Leaders who lead leaders multiply because they want to be succeeded. Wow. Security. Wow. And that's what I do in the last part of the book. The book is called The Way to Win, Coaching and Developing Men in Matters of Life and Faith. I would encourage everybody to get a copy. This has been a great podcast, man. Awesome. We love having you here. Uh, just can't wait to have you back. I feel like I just got into the preach as you started me with fishing. And it was uh, well, I was going to ask, can we bring an organ? and may have an organ back in the room. Um, now, hey, so good. love you. Love how you love shepherding people. Uh, and leading people, and um, I want to go fishing next time you're in town. Oh, let's do it, man. Awesome. Come on, crankbaits. Come yes, on, that's, okay. uh, look look that up. If you're not from the, uh, the southeastern United States, look up a crankbait. You'll find out what that is. <laughs> hey, on. thanks so much for joining us on the Grow Leader Podcast. We'll see you next month, very very soon. See you. Hey, thanks so much for listening today. We want to say a big thank you to the incredible partners that help make the Grow Leader Podcast happen each and every time that you hear it. The first is Compassion International. For over 70 years, Compassion International has served the vulnerable children of the world in Jesus' name through the power of the local church. That's why we love them so much here at Grow Leader. They've impacted over 2.2 million children worldwide, and you can learn how you can be a part of all that Compassion is doing at Compassion.com slash Grow Leader. And the next is WIF, the Wesleyan Investment Foundation. For over 80 years, Wesleyan Investment Foundation has helped churches with their borrowing and their investing needs Whether you're dreaming of new opportunities or seeking wise resource management, we really think WIF can help you. Learn more about all they can do for your organization at wifonline.com slash growleader.